Okay, in this lecture, we want to talk a little bit about plasticity in, in a 1D bar, focusing now on the constitutive law of an elastic, perfectly plastic material. So I want to first remind you of just some uh, constitutive laws uh, in the elastic regime, so without reference to plasticity first. So I'll just say as a refresher, let's say recall um, some simple elasticity constitutive laws. Okay, the first is just the linear elastic. And, and if you remember, this is just Hooke's law. Uh, and remember, we're in a 1D uh, problem, so that's just that stress is equal to E Young's modulus times the strain. And, it, and remember, it's the elastic strain. Then we also could talk about nonlinear elastic constitutive laws, which probably aren't familiar to you, but I'll just give you a couple simple ones to start with. Okay, we might we might write this as sigma is going to be equal to e uh, maybe times the log of the stretch ratio lambda. That's one way we could write it, or maybe e times the logarithmic strain or the true strain e sub l. We could also write um, if we wanted to use use the shear modulus in this case, we could write this could be the stress could be g times uh, lambda minus one over lambda squared. Right? Those would be some fairly simple nonlinear non elastic constitutive laws. And then finally, we could talk about uh, thermoelastic. Right, where thermoelastic looked like sigma was going to be equal to the the uh, Young's modulus times now the strain minus the thermal strain, we call that E theta. And we could write this also as E times epsilon minus alpha times theta minus theta naught, right, where that's a reference temperature. That's our current temperature T, and this is a, a linear coefficient of thermal expansion. Okay, so again, that's just a, a quick refresher of some constitutive laws you may have seen before. Now I want to talk about uh, elastic, perfectly plastic material, and we're going to see if we can look at what that constitutive law should look like. Okay, it's probably going to be easiest here to draw a picture. It's probably most helpful in this case to draw a picture. So an elastic, perfectly plastic material, there's my stress axis. Here's my strain axis, so here's strain, stress. It's going to behave linearly in the linear region, and then once it reaches some value, some value here, we'll call it sigma naught. Once it reaches that value, it just yields and it doesn't increase in stress. And if we were to put it into compression in the same way, uh, we would end up with similar behavior. It yields now at negative sigma naught. Okay. So if the material in general is, is linear elastic, um, we could write that uh, when it's inside the linear elastic region, it just obeys Hooke's law. And then we could do the same thing that we had talked about doing um, previously with an eigenstrain, but just subtracting it off the total strain. So we could write in, in sort of the most simple form that that sigma, the stress, is going to be equal to E, Young's modulus, times epsilon, the total strain, minus the plastic strain, epsilon P. Now, epsilon P obviously is the plastic strain. Okay, It's, it's essentially an uh, internal state variable. And, and we know what it is initially. If I hand you a, a piece of metal, don't tell you anything about it, you're going to take that initially the plastic strain is zero. Right. Whether or not that's actually true or not, we, it's very hard to define the, the original uh, strain state uh, in any material. But, but we typically, when we talk about plasticity, we define something as initially having a plastic strain of zero. Okay. So that sounds well and good. How do we decide how the plastic strain evolves? So I want to first ask the question, 
when does the plastic strain increase? Or, or when does it grow? Well, you can look at the, the curve of the elastic, perfectly plastic material, and you can probably say, well, I'm going to start accumulating plastic strain whenever my stress exceeds, or whenever it reaches, rather, uh, sigma naught. So let's say yielding occurs uh, when, when sigma equals sigma naught, but really it's the magnitude of sigma, right? It could be, it could be positive or negative. So when the absolute value of sigma equals sigma naught, okay? Sometimes we'll call sigma naught the initial yield, although in this case, there's no um, strengthening as we yield, so it's effectively the, it's the, the, the same yield stress the entire, the entire time. So hopefully that's straightforward. We, we actually are a little bit more formal in our definition Rather than just say that we take the magnitude of the stress and set it equal to sigma naught, and when that occurs, then we say yielding is happening, we define what's called a yield function. Okay? And so for an elastic, perfectly plastic material, that yield function is going to look like F is equal to the magnitude of sigma minus sigma naught. So what does that mean? It means such that the material is linear elastic where uh, F is less than zero and, and it yields or accumulates plastic strain when F equals zero. Okay, so hopefully that's straightforward. We could write this same equation if we wanted, if we don't like the absolute values, which I don't usually, we could write the, a yield function that looks like F is equal to, let's just say sigma squared minus sigma naught the quantity squared, right? That would give us the same, uh, the same yield times or the, the same yeah, stresses at yield. Whenever the stress, whether it was positive or negative, whenever the magnitude got to be the same as sigma naught, then, then F would equal zero and that would indicate yielding. So that's, that's when yielding happens, when plastic strain begins to accumulate. The next question we have to ask is how much uh, plastic strain accumulates? Okay, and to answer this question, we define what's called a flow rule. And the flow rule says that the plastic strain increment, uh, I'm gonna, the plastic strain increment, d epsilon p, is going to be equal to, when yielding happens, it's going to be equal to some fraction beta times the total strain increment, d epsilon. When is this going to occur? Well, we just said above, that's going to happen when f, which is a function of sigma, equals zero. And then zero, uh, we'll say, it's going to not accumulate at all otherwise. Okay, and what, what this really says is that the stress is equal to the yield stress. Okay, let me ask a question, though. What happens if uh, we have, uh, so we're, we're talking about, these, these increments of stress or increments of strain, what happens if sigma is equal to, let's say, negative sigma naught, right? If that was the case, that would give me F equals zero because negative sigma naught squared uh, is, is going to be equal to sigma naught squared, which is subtracting the two gives me zero. So that would suggest that I have yield, right? But, but what if we're unloading? Right? And unloading in this case, so we're at a negative stress. If we unload, that means we're going to increase the stress so that in this case, we'll say that d sigma is going to be equal to zero. So the increment of stress at this time is equal to zero. Okay, similarly, what happens if uh, sigma equals sigma naught, but our increment of loading d sigma is less than zero? We're, un we're, we're still unloading, but now we're going down from a positive value. Well, in those cases, we, we shouldn't be accumulating plastic strain. So what we're saying is that the, the stress increment, d sigma, uh, should not cause change in plastic strain. Okay, so what we really want is for the case where f equals zero, but this d sigma term happens to be in the, in, in the directions that we've just shown to indicate unloading, we want that to go in the otherwise category. So how do we do this? Well, let me just suggest something and then we'll, we'll verify it. What if we said that we'll take sigma times d sigma and we want that quantity to be greater than zero, right? In addition to, 
f equals zero, right? So what happens here? If, if sigma is negative and d sigma is also negative and we're at f equals zero, then we're, we're, we're trying to go below, we're trying to go beyond that, that uh, yield point. So we would want yielding to occur. So that would give us a positive value. <clears throat> And that looks correct. Similarly, if if sigma was positive and d sigma was positive, then we would also be trying to to cause yielding. So that looks correct. But anytime those signs are opposite, then we wouldn't want it to um, to cause uh, yielding. Okay, we're going to write that a little bit more formally. So formally, we actually write that the partial of f with respect to sigma times d sigma is greater than zero. So that looks kind of confusing. So let's look at this partial term. If f was our, our so let's say f was the uh, sigma squared minus sigma naught squared component, then the partial of f with respect to sigma is just equal to two times sigma, right? Two times sigma d sigma being greater than zero also implies that sigma times d sigma is greater than zero. So that's that's uh, that's an equivalent statement. So we're going to go ahead now and write the flow rule formally as, as this beta d epsilon term, just like we had, subject to f of sigma <clears throat> equals zero. But we're now going to add and the partial of f with respect to sigma times d sigma is also greater than zero. And then this will be zero otherwise. So what does this say? This says that that during yielding, some fraction beta of, of, of any total strain increment d epsilon uh, goes into a plastic strain increment d epsilon p. That's all this equation is saying. It doesn't tell us how much. It doesn't tell us the value of beta or anything like that. But now let's go ahead and, and uh, look, about, uh, look at the strain uh, decomposition. So we have an additive strain decomposition that says that d epsilon is equal to the d epsilon elastic plus d epsilon plastic, right? So that's hopefully something um, that, that we uh, remember from, from a couple lectures ago. And we have a stress increment uh, as d sigma, okay? And we can write d sigma in a couple ways. We could say that d sigma is gonna be equal to e times d epsilon elastic, right? Or sometimes we can write uh, write it in tangent form. It's equivalent. Uh, d sigma is equal to the tangent modulus times the total strain increment, right? So uh, maybe you had forgotten what the tangent modulus looks like. The tangent modulus is just the slope at any point. So in a linear elastic case, the tangent modulus is just E in our perfectly plastic case, once we're above the yield point, the tangent modulus uh, follows this line. That that has a slope of zero. So E tan uh, equals zero uh, when we're yielding. Okay. So what does that mean? That means that during yield, the stress increment d sigma is equal to zero. So if the stress increment's equal to zero, then this first equation becomes, right, this d sigma equals e d epsilon e equals zero. What that says is that e, e times the elastic strain increment is the total strain increment d epsilon minus the plastic strain increment d epsilon p. That equals zero. <coughs> This is not the tangent modulus. This is the elastic Young's modulus. That's not zero. So this quantity must be zero. So that implies that d epsilon p is equal to d epsilon. And if you go back and compare our, our uh, <clears throat> flow rule, if d, if d epsilon p is equal to d epsilon, that suggests that beta equals one. Okay, so... Therefore, beta equals one for perfectly plastic uh, behavior. Okay, so uh, what I wanted to say about this whole thing is that it highlights um, it highlights 
many of the features that that's in a much more complex plasticity model uh, just with this really simple model. Let me give you, uh, it, it highlights three of the four critical features, I'll say. So let me give you three of them and then I'll list a fourth that, that we'll have to address uh, as we move to more complex models. So let's say we observe uh, three of the four key ingredients here uh, to plasticity theory. Okay, number one, it's the strain decomposition. Right? We said that this is d epsilon is equal to d epsilon elastic plus d epsilon plastic. Okay? Number two, we observe the existence of a yield function. So f of sigma equals zero governs the onset of yield, right? Plus the constraint that the partial of f with respect to sigma d sigma be greater than zero, right? That's that's our um, that's something we're going to come back to over and over again. Number three, we also see the existence of a flow rule, right? That was uh, that relates the plastic strain increment to the total strain increment. And then there's actually a a fourth that I that is is critical, but we didn't talk about here. In addition to having um, a yield function and a flow rule being dependent on stress, let's say, they could also be dependent on other internal variables. Maybe it's dislocation density. Maybe, maybe we have uh, some sort of other hardening parameters that we care about to talk about how um, maybe the yield surface changes. We didn't have a yield surface or a yield point. We just had sigma naught. It was a fixed value, but that could evolve. Uh, and we may need some more other variables to describe those. In that case, we would need evolution equations for those additional internal variables. Okay, so hopefully that, that was a relatively simple example of, of um, uh, constitutive law for a plastic, a plastic material, in this case, elastic, perfectly plastic. Um, the next the next level of complexity is to move to a material that that exhibits isotropic hardening so that'll be the next the focus of the next uh, topic but hopefully this gives you a, a little bit of a framework to think about um, the development of these equations going forward